If you're trying to make any kind of meaningful, effective change in your life, you've come to the right place. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I am so happy to have you back with us. I'm Lori Bischoff, and it is time to talk shift. Today, I am very excited to have one of my favorite guests back with us again. Yes, Jordan River will be coming back for the third time. And, you know, that's because Jordan is the coffee expert. And you all know I talk about coffee frequently. I love coffee. I'm a coffee fanatic. I love good coffee. And so whenever I learn something new about this magical elixir, I cannot wait to share it with you guys. And of course, Jordan is my expert go-to on this subject. By the way, for those of you that did not see him or hear him when he's been on before, let me just remind you that Jordan himself is a professional podcast producer. Um, he's got multiple shows in production, and one of them is called the Coffee Health and Science Podcast, which I listen to frequently. I know it may sound boring, but I'm telling you, if you give it a listen, it is super fascinating, the stuff that you can learn. Anyway, on it, Jordan always shares the most cutting edge, scientifically backed information about coffee and health. So today we're going to cover in our coffee convo, uh, some fun coffee facts and some trivia. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to get the medicinal effects out of coffee, because trust me, there are plenty and probably quite a few that you don't even know about. So. That is why I think today especially, um, why it would be really good to know why coffee prepared the right way and the right kind can actually be a really good health supplement helping to weather this COVID climate that we're in. Anything that can help, right? So by the end of this show, I think that you will be enlightened with some fascinating coffee trivia, and you will be able to astound your holiday guests with it. So before I bring Jordan on, though, I want to have a little bit of fun. I thought it would be fun to um, talk a little bit about a couple of my favorite, well, they're coffee holiday drinks. That's the only time of year we have them. And so, um, yeah, let's, let's have a chat about that uh, with Christy. Christy, are you a coffee drinker? I don't remember if you are or not. Lori, I actually am not. I am whatever the opposite of a coffee drinker would be. I don't know that I've ever even sat and, ha and had an entire cup. I do have a cup of tea every morning before my workout, but that is the extent. I don't do the, the fraps and the whips and the caps with the stuff. I, I just, um, I'm just not into it, but I do love anything that's fun, flavorful, like being a former bartender, I love like mm. craft mixed drinks. And I think you can do a lot of that same kind of thing these days with coffee drinks, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not one of those, um, you know, mocha, choco, latte, lady marmalade kind of <laughs> like, I don't like those either. I don't like sugar in my coffee. So the only time I make the exception is like twice a year when we make our special coffee drinks on uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But I started early. Like, I think I um, took my first pull off a cup of coffee when I was like four or five, thanks to my dear grandmother, who was a <laughs> coffee drinker. And I hung out with Grams a lot. So she started me as a wee one <laughs> with my little cup of coffee. And uh, yeah, so I've been drinking coffee literally my entire life. Um, but I'll tell you what, speaking about bartenders and coffee drinks, um, I was introduced to my really favorite, uh, first favorite holiday coffee drink, I should say, back in the 80s when um, we lived in Minneapolis still. And one of our favorite places to go was TGI Fridays. It was near us. And we had a good friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had a good friend, Tim, who bartended there. And Tim would make these amazing coffee drinks that they had called Cafe Reese. And this thing was, it was served in like a, uh, a giant Pinot Noir size wine goblet. So it was, it was huge. And in it was, of course, the coffee. And I can't remember if it was whiskey or vodka in there, but one of those alcohols, of course, was in there. And then it was um, Bailey's and Frangelica and Kahlua. All of that went in there. And then they did the old frothy cream, you know, layered on the top thing. 
And let me tell you, it was addicting. It was so yummy, especially in a Minnesota winter, right? You go in and you have this delicious hot coffee drink and it's massive and yeah, it warms you up good. And you really only need one because it's massive. So it's like eating a gigantic piece of cake, you know? (laughs) And then, and then we say we have our liquid long johns on, right? For the walk home. Totally. Exactly. Right. And your snowmobile boots. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so then about 12 years ago, Eric and I were in San Francisco and we came across the Bona Vista Cafe or the Bona Vista restaurant there. It's kind of a famous place. Have you ever been? Have you been there? Have you heard of it? I haven't, no. Okay. Well, I I'm swear intrigued. after this, yeah, after this, you are going to want to go. Let me tell you, first of all, San Francisco is the best place to eat, the best restaurants and food, so much good stuff there. Um, so that's just like right there. That's all the reason you need to go to San Francisco. But, but anyway, we come across the Bona Vista Cafe and they have their world famous Irish coffees there. This coffee drink you have to see it. The way that they do it is it's a show. It's amazing. And they put out hundreds and hundreds of these coffee drinks every day. They're known for it. So it became my family's favorite. Our kids love them. My, my uh, Eric's sister and brother, we all make them every year on Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we actually even ordered, I'm going to show it to you now before it all is blended together because I made one without the whiskey. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) come on, Lori. It's almost noon. (laughs) You know, yeah, it's noon somewhere. You know, sometimes there's just those words, you know, you're going to trip over. And I was like, if I have a sip of that with whiskey in it, I'm going to be tripping over every other word. But this is what it looks like. See, these are even the little Bona Vista Mm. glasses. You can order them. This is exactly the size. This is the glass that they make them in. All right. Now, this is starting to blend a little bit, but you, cause it's been sitting here for a few minutes, but you can see how usually there's your coffee drink with the yumminess in it. And then the layer of yummy cream that lays across the top. So let me just tell you, because I think it's so interesting. The story, I have the little brochure here because they actually give you the recipe. Oh. It's not a secret. They tell you exactly how to make these. They sell you the glass and boom, you're off to the races. So I think this is really interesting though. So let me tell you the Irish coffee story. I'm going to read it right off their pamphlet, all right? Here we go. The historic venture started on the night of November 10 in 1952. Jack Kepler, then owner of the Bona Vista, challenged international travel writer Stanton Delaplane to help recreate a highly touted Irish coffee served at Shannon Airport in Ireland. Hmm. Intrigued, Stan accepted Jack's invitation, and the pair began to experiment immediately. Throughout the night, the two of them stirred and sipped judiciously. Whew, I so was afraid I was going to mess that word up. (laughs) And eventually acknowledged two recurring problems. While the taste was not quite right, hmm, and the cream would not float which is very important. It must float on the top. That's what makes it special. So Stan's hopes sank like the cream, but Jack (laughs) was undaunted. (laughs) So the restaurateur pursued the elusive elixir with religious fervor, even making a pilgrimage (laughs) overseas to Shannon Airport. Upon Jack's return, the experimentation continued. Finally, the perfect tasting Irish whiskey was selected. And then the problem of the bottom vent cream was taken to San Francisco's mayor, a prominent dairy owner. Mm -hmm. It was discovered (laughs) that when the cream was aged for 48 hours and frothed to a precise consistency, and let me tell you, it's precise. We usually get it wrong. (laughs) <laughs> it would float as deliciously and delicately as a swan on the surface of Jack's and Stan's special nectar. Success was theirs. Woohoo! So with the recipe now mastered, a sparkling clear six ounce heat treated goblet was chosen as a suitable chalice. Soon the fame of the Bona Vista's Irish coffee spread throughout the land See, I can't believe you haven't heard of it, Christy. I mean, it's spread throughout the land. 
<laughs> You're putting the word out there today, Lori. <laughs> right? Everybody going to know about it now. So today it is still the same delicious mixture and it's still the same clamorous cosmopolitan Bona Vista. Both delightful experiences, which I can attest to. Absolutely. <laughs> So are you inspired now? Maybe to give it a try. Well, yeah, that was such a fun story um, and inspirational too. A great one for the holidays. I you know, so. never give up, even if it's just to offer people the most perfect holiday drink. I think so too. I think so too. And uh, let me tell you, I've had Irish coffees. We have tried them at various restaurants throughout the land and nobody's ever even comes close to the Bona Vista Irish coffee. So if you can't get there, go on their website. I sound like I'm, you know, marketing the Bonavista. I'm really not. I'm just a huge fan. But you can go on their website, get the recipe. You can even order these special yummy glasses and have yourself a fun holiday treat. So, well, that's okay. I'll jump in as your podcast producer to promote the podcast. Those of you who are listeners of We're Talking Shift, we are also on YouTube where you can see Lori's beautiful drink that she has made. <laughs> <laughs> and it yeah. really is gorgeous. It's worth hopping over to YouTube to check it out. Yeah, thank you for that. Because um, I didn't even think of that. And it's fun. A couple of years ago, our daughter, uh, Montana, did, um, she made a fun little video clip of us, the family, making these at home, the whole step by step process. So, um, you know, we put it on Facebook. And then every year, you know, in the memory, pops up around Christmas, we repost it. It's really fun and it's really cute. So uh, probably as we get close to Christmas, that video is going to pop up again and I'm going to repost it like I do every year. So if you go over to my Facebook page, you will be able to see the Bischoffs making their uh, annual Irish coffees. It's fun. It's really cute. Oh, and I just love a, a family holiday tradition. You know, yeah. those things are more important, I think, this year than ever, just to have that sense of normalcy. Totally. I agree. So, all right. With that fun little conversation appetizer, why don't we go ahead and bring our expert on, Jordan River. Jordan, it is so good to have you back again. Welcome. Hey, Lori. How's it going? Good to be back on the show. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's been going great. As you can see, since you were with us last, we have now gone to video. So, yeah, you had to just sort of um, gussy up a little bit for this one. <laughs> That's right. I'm an audio type of guy. I got that face for radio. So uh, uh, forgive me for rushing to get on the, the stream here, but here we are. I'm ready to rock it. And by the way, you look great. The set looks Thank great. I love your new setup. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, um, all right. First of all, I have to say, because I am a... Um, a frequent listener of your podcast, the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. And nice. I, yes, I love it. I am just a coffee freak. So um, like you, being a coffee lover, I, you know, and in into health, I'm all about soaking up all the details. But I really want to just say, every time I turn on your podcast, that music and your voice quality is so awesome. It's literally like, it puts me in the same state, Jordan, as if I was putting on like Sade. It's like- Oh, that's so, great. Oh, it's awesome. I love it. I appreciate Just, that. Yeah. I mean, it's important. Music is important, right? And- and you have a great voice. So I just want to say it's super smooth and I love it. And uh, everybody check it out. I think- That means a lot to me, Lori. Uh, it really does. This show is is incredible. It was kind of unique and a bit eclectic, but it just goes well. And the listeners, you know, the subscribers are growing every single month. And like you said, we focus on coffee and health and a lot of health in general. Yeah. But I know what piques your interest today and what piques a lot of people's interests are these coffee history episodes where I'm learning more about facts about coffee and how coffee kind of came to be and, and the history and past of coffee. It's, it's much more complex and fascinating than I originally would have been led to believe. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot there. And so I'm glad you mentioned that because that is exactly some of the things that I want us to dive into um, today. Um, remind me, though, before we start jumping into all the fascinating coffee factoids, um, tell me what got you so interested in coffee and how, you know, and what, why did you decide to literally devote an entire podcast to coffee health and the science of coffee and everything? My story is different than most people. You know, usually people grow up drinking coffee or start drinking coffee when they get a job, they have to wake up early or something like that. I was never into coffee until my late 20s. 
Um, I have always been into kind of taking personal responsibility for your health. And I've been into learning health science. Um, I had a history of epilepsy and really had to come to grips with that and uh, manage my epilepsy now without any medication. And that led me down the road of kind of, I don't want to say alternative medicine, but just functional medicine, taking responsibility for your health. And when I met Andrew Salisbury, who owns Purity Coffee, he turned me on to the research behind coffee and health. And he introduced me to Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, Harvard medical professor, and I would say the world's leading expert on coffee and health. Um, that's when every, I just realized when I talked to him, there's a podcast here. I teamed up with Andrew, I teamed up with Sanjeev and Dr. Coffee, and we were off to the races. So awesome. I love it. That's, uh, that's interesting though. Um, yeah, your journey. I, I, I don't remember if we talked about that on our first podcast or not, but, um, but in case somebody didn't hear that one, I really wanted you to go into it again. That's interesting how you came to become so fascinated with coffee. I got into coffee, as I was telling Christy shortly ago, like at the ripe old age of four or five on my visits <laughs> with grandma. That's right. I do remember that. Yeah. It's so, interesting. A lot of cultures do that. It's yeah. really uh, taboo to give your kids coffee here in the States, but I was talking to someone from Argentina and they're like, yeah, we can give our four-year-olds coffee like all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what do you mean all the time? And uh, I even, I did an episode of Dr. Coffee about that and, and uh, it's interesting. Some cultures do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, I don't think there was any downside unless, you know, we find out that it is absolutely scientifically proven that coffee stunts your growth. Cause I think maybe I could have gotten That's what I brought branches, up. right? <laughs> Dr. Gotten... Coffee said that wasn't the case. You shouldn't worry. Don't blame okay. the coffee. Cause, cause okay. I brought that up and he, he like <laughs> shut that down really quick. He said, we don't know like what the causes are, but the stunted growth thing, like, the, you put the kibosh okay. on that. It was really okay. funny. But, okay. Um, so I'm not going to hold yeah. that against grandma. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> But uh, yeah, really fascinating stuff. And the health side is fascinating, but the history and facts side might be more fascinating. Yeah. So let's start with um, monks. Tell me what monks have to do with coffee. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I think we might actually take a step back to just kind of learning origins of phrases okay. in coffee. That's really what, uh, what was eye-opening to me and will lead us down the road to coffee and monks as in, you know, holy friars. Right, so right. a couple interesting fa facts about coffee terminology. You hear coffee, uh, you, heard, hear, you hear the term mocha, mocha chino, and it's kind of like there's different drinks. A lot of people associate that with chocolate and coffee. Well, the term mocha actually used to be common for coffee, just like Joe or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the reason that was, was because almost all coffee in the world for the longest time was funneled through a city called mocha in the Middle East. And so that's what they referred to as mocha. And you know what changed that was when the Dutch decided to start cultivating coffee in Java, Indonesia. So the Dutch were a world power and they snuck some coffee out of the Middle East and they started growing it in Java. And then Java became a term kind of like a cup of Joe, a cup of Java mm -hmm. for coffee. So a lot of these names, shorthand or otherwise that we have attributed to coffee come from historical uh, foundations. Now, what you said, well, maybe the coolest origin that I found was of the cappuccino. That's what you're referring to, right? Yeah, yeah. the cappuccino. And I thought for sure it was like, again, probably some city, right? Maybe, uh, maybe after the recipe had nothing to do with that. The cappuccino is named because of its color. And the color of the cappuccino drink resembles the same color of the holy robes of the men of the Capuchin friars. They were monks in the 1500s in Italy, a Vatican subsect. And it turns out that those holy men had robes that looked a lot like a cappuccino. How incredible is that? That is so interesting. And I'll tell you what else is interesting, just a little connective tissue to that. Where we are in Cody, Wyoming, which is just outside of the east entrance to Yellowstone Park, um, somewhere between here and there, uh, so very near to me, there are, um, there's a community of monks um, called the Carmelite monks. And um, they actually sell mystic monk coffee in, in our region oh, here. Oh, wait, I've had that stuff. That stuff is good. Yeah. So, I mean, the story goes that they were looking for a way to support, you know, their, their growing community. So after much discernment and prayer, they had the inspiration to start roasting and selling their coffee beans. And so it's in the stores here. And I just think that that's super interesting about the connection with monks. Um, that uh, I, you know, the only reason that I don't 
buy it. I've heard that it's really good, but it's to the best of my knowledge, because I don't see it on the package, it's not organic. I definitely don't want to get off track here, but interestingly enough, I was just in Colombia on the farms and uh, on, on the farms where Purity Coffee gets their beans from, organic farms. And they were telling me that some coffee farmers farm organically and can't afford the certification. So yes, you definitely should buy organic, but the coffee is a wild world and you don't know what you're getting. You might find a hidden bean. This is really good. Why is this so good? Well, it might actually be grown organically. You just don't have certification. So interesting little side note. No, that is a good side note. And that you have just inspired me to send them an email and actually just ask them. Because you're right. A lot of um, farmers and growers, they just can't jump through all those hoops and check every single box, even when their products are organic. So I'm going to check that out. And then I could kind of support my local monk tribe. Yeah, the local Carmelites. I love that. (laughs) Right? Interesting. Okay, so so that covers the monks and coffee. All right, let's talk about some other fun things like, you know, human consumption of coffee like how much coffee do our americans going through and oh my gosh you know how much money are we spending on coffee americans go through a lot but the Finns take the cake on that i guess i guess we'll start with americans and i have some notes here um americans consume 400 million cups of coffee per day and you might think that that would be enough to supply the globe but actually globally humans consume ready for this 2.25 billion cups of coffee every day and, and this is why I'm passionate about regenerative agriculture, where, where these beans are coming from. This is why I'm passionate about recyclable K-cups. Um, you know what I mean? It doesn't seem like a big deal, but 2.25 billion a day, that's, yeah. a, that's huge. So it, it really is substantial. And, and to give you a, a volume amount, that's 158 million gallons of coffee each day. Actually, more than that. I can't even like wrap my head around that. It's just so much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, and I guess in some cultures, <laughs> cups of coffee are, are tiny, like little, right? Like you have little espresso size. Like if you're in right. Turkey, you're probably going to get one of those little like espresso size cups, you know, but like I have my gigantic seats, the same size as my yes. kid. <laughs> That's right. That's great. You know, but all right, all right. They so, said that about a couple of presidents. I think it was Roosevelt who had a, a coffee cup the size of a bathtub. Um, <laughs> but I do want to finish here just really quickly. I said yeah. the Finns drink the most coffee. Right. And the stunning statistic behind that is uh, Finns drink over 26 pounds of coffee annually per capita, per person. So if you think about that, that per capita means it accounts for the non-coffee drinkers. So if half the people in the country drink coffee, which is probably under, that's 52 pounds of coffee yearly. They drink a lot of coffee, every single one of them. So the wow. Finns, Finland is the place to go for, for consumption. <laughs> I wonder if they let their kiddos, their four. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking, right? They have to at that rate. I would think so. Okay. <laughs> so how do you feel about giving us some of the deets on Starbucks? Um, listen, actually... I'm down to give you the deets on Starbucks because it's not going to be as damning as you think. Okay. And that's really what this exploration has opened my eyes to even more is that Starbucks was actually a big step up in the coffee evolution chain. We were going down the wrong path for a while in the, in the fifties. Actually, if you go back to the early 1900s when instant coffee was invented, it was actually pretty incredible because we could get coffee into the hands of our fighting men over in World War II, actually back to World War I. So it was like, wow, this is incredible. But that put us down that road of cheap, dirty coffee that lasts in, on the shelf be, because it was a great kind of um, you know, innovation. But we went a little too far down that road. We went in the you know, best part of waking up is Folgers, which is just Robusta. It's low quality beans. That family friendly bulk coffee was no good. And Starbucks kind of started to bring us out of that. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's not going to be nearly as good as your specialty coffees, and it's still high acidity. It's not organic. They're using pesticides. You know all that. The stuff I can't stand. I could go hard on Starbucks, but I think it was a necessary step in the evolution, and it is also far and away the most popular coffee chain. It's popularized coffee to a large degree. So Right. It really has. And you know, it's interesting because um, they actually make some of their bagged beans that you can, you know, buy and take home. They have one blend. I think it's Yukon blend that is organic, but they there don't, go. 
Yeah, but they don't offer it, you know, as if you're going to go up and have them make you a coffee. I've never seen it offered as even as, you know, like at a higher price to get a cup of organic brewed coffee from them. Yeah. So I, I don't know why that is. but That's I mean, because of a supply chain problem because oh. they would have to supply that. I mean, I guess they could do a limited release, but mm. it makes sense that they could mail those beans out but not supply them in store because they'd have to have it, – it, you, need, you need the sources, the single source, single origin sources – to get that certification or a lot of organic farmers. So it's tough to do, yeah. but um, God bless them for doing that. I hope they do yeah. more. Yeah, totally. Um, so is instant coffee. Let's talk, before we talk about instant coffee, let's, let's talk about um, the coffee break trivia. I want to talk about instant coffee in a little bit yes. when we talk about some other health benefits. Let's yeah. Let's talk about the coffee break trivia and, and sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the coffee break. It, uh, it originated from a little town in Wisconsin. I believe it was a town called Staunton, Wisconsin. And uh, this was a really interesting one for me. It was the very first place where the workforce coffee break was like instated. Um, and, and this was a long, long time ago. You know, the industrial revolution and coffee shaped our nine to five. You know what I mean? Uh, there was a lot of fighting in between there, actually, especially in the early 1900s, fighting for our right to a nine to five. But uh, the way we go to work, we take a coffee break. This has all been shaped uh, by a lot in a large part due to coffee and due to the Industrial Revolution. And the coffee break originated from Wisconsin. You can thank them. And I believe it was, let me get this right, I believe it was the Norwegian immigrants. Again, these Scandinavians. Scan Scandinavians love their coffee. And uh, they said, hey, we're going to be working here uh, as immigrants in Wisconsin, but we need our coffee break. And then it went, it went nationwide and beyond. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, what and I, I'm like thinking, okay, we used to go through Wisconsin a lot. We have friends in Wisconsin. I'm gonna like put out the word and be like, is this the thing in in what is it, Staunton? Staunton? Staunton, Wisconsin. And it is Staunton. the thing that they even have I mean, a coffee break festival every oh, year. So so it's yeah. the, I mean, it's the thing. Yes, absolutely. But I'm going to ask them then if they've ever gone to the Coffee Break Festival. Yes. Interesting. Huh. I wonder what you do at the Coffee Break Festival. Do you just go on break at the festival? Is that what you do? They probably drink a lot of coffee. That's what they do. Yeah, I'm sure there's got to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine. I don't know. But, it, you know, if there's, there's, it's Wisconsin. Like, is there cheese there? <laughs> uh, is there dairy there? You know, oh, think... cheese and coffee. Yeah, good point, though. You probably get the milk in the coffee. That would be good. Right? Good point. Right. Good point. Who knows? Okay, what about the, uh, the webcam thing? I heard you talking about. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a short one, but this is a cool one. You know, webcams, especially during COVID, webcams have become so ubiquitous to connecting right. us is how we're doing this media right now and talking to, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of people out there, tens yeah. of thousands, who knows? And uh, the webcam is where it all started. And where did the webcam start? It started at the University of Cambridge. Now, why would somebody invent a webcam? Probably a million different reasons, but they were coffee freaks at the University of Cambridge. And they couldn't stand the idea of the pot running empty. So what do they do with their first webcam? They set it, they pointed it towards the coffee pot so that they could check to see if someone needed to make up, probably while they were coding or working on something incredibly important. The first ever webcam was placed to monitor a coffee pot. It's pretty wild, right? Priorities. Priorities. Right? <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's a little bit weird, but coffee has shaped a lot of stuff around us. It's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, I mean, who would have ever even connected those dots in a million years? I think that's super fascinating. Okay, what about these, um, these edible, I was going to make some of these and I just ran out of time because I actually wanted to have one um, to show you, but these little caffeinated balls, like, yeah. like edible, tell me about that. This is pre-coffee. So a lot of people might not know the coffee, co uh, ed drinkable coffee, I'm sorry, drinkable coffee comes from a dried roasted seed of a cherry. Coffee comes from the, uh, the cherry tree, which uh, I'm sorry, coffee comes from the coffee cherry tree and you pick the cherries and the bean is actually the seed inside. But there's a bunch of good cherry meat on the outside. And the funny thing is that's what coffee was for the longest time. People would take the fruit and eat it. People would mash it up and make it into balls for hundreds, thousands of years until very recently. About 500 years ago, that's when they started kind of brewing it into a, into a drinkable brew as we do now. So although coffee is quite old as a plant and as a stimulant, again, 
um, eating the, the cherry meat, mixing it with animal fat uh, mm -hmm. and making these energy balls. Only, only a couple hundred years ago did we start drying the beans, roasting them, and drinking them in a brew. Wow. And so what a potent little like fuel ball between, yeah, right. right. Between the caffeine and the coffee bean or the meat, right. Of yeah. it. And then, um, and then the, uh, fuel in the fat, the animal fat, pure fuel. So they must've been like able to be like the ultra runners, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Right? And this Go was, on. most of this took place in Northern Africa where they had a kind of monopoly on coffee. That, again, back to the history lesson, before it spread, those were um, African cultures that would make that, that kind of energy ball coffee. It's really interesting because we literally have, have the drink coffee ubiquitous with the plant, but there was yeah. hundreds of years, actually a little over a thousand there where it was uh, hmm. not as we knew it. Right. Yeah. I, I, uh, I looked for some, I was like, maybe I can find some sort of a recipe for, you know, I'm, I'm Googling like, fat coffee ball. Uh, this is an ancient recipe. Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder if so, uh, there has to be cultures that still do it. I'm sure, going to look sure. into this more. I'm so glad you took an interest in that. I'm going to look oh, into that more. Totally. Totally. I found like, I found a couple of recipes that would have been like a current version of that. So I, I saved one and I was like, all right, I'm going to make this and I'm going to get some, uh, use my purity coffee beans, right. Nice. And, and make this concoction, this, this caffeinated fat ball and I'm gonna see how it turns out. I'll let you know. You're awesome. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So, um, let's do this. I have a couple of non-trivia questions for you. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll just see. We'll see where that takes us. Okay, so non-organic, organic, certified organic. Why is it especially important to buy organic coffee? Remind our listeners. I always say this. This is the most important thing. I work with Purity Coffee because they test above and beyond um, puritycoffee.com, use code river. I'm always trying to promote them, but honestly, I want you guys drinking organically. That's the most important thing, organic certified, because if they are certified, they've gone through the practices. That doesn't mean that we said this before, your favorite coffee, if you know that they're doing the regenerative practices, taking care of the land, tending to the microbes, then great, continue to drink that coffee, but you need to know how it was produced. The reason why is the health benefits go down significantly when you grow them in what we would call traditional farming, but really is only a farming practice that's about 100 years old. This is using synthetic fertilizers, which are chelated salt nutrients, which harm the soil. They destroy the soil food web. Uh, they use chemical pesticides to eradicate pests instead of more natural means. Those pesticides end up as residue on your coffee. Um, there's mold on your coffee if you don't grow it properly. They monocrop, meaning they grow only coffee. And that does damage to the land. There's a lot that goes into this. And if mm -hmm. you can buy rainforest certified or and or organic certified, those are huge steps in the direction for the health of you and for the health of the planet. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I will, uh, like right now, I'm, I'm waiting for my next order of purity coffee. Um, so, it, you know, to, to fill the gap, bridge the gap, I just go and I find the best organic one that I can get locally to hold me over until my new order comes in the mail. I, I haven't found a healthier one, but again, coffee is a taste thing. Purity has roasted for health, so it's a, it's a medium roast. I think it's mm. delicious. I think it's a delicious medium roast, but some people aren't going to drink it unless it's dark. Some people aren't right. going to drink it unless it's light. So find that organic for you. And, and do it for your health because you will notice a difference. Yeah. And this is something I meant to ask you a little bit ago. How, f for people that are just kind of buying the usual stuff that they've been buying, you know, the same stuff their parents bought and their grandparents bought in the store, in the cans, how fresh is that coffee? Some of that can be really old, months old. It, it's oftentimes shipped over on slow boats and they don't seal them super well. Only the specialty coffees are using things like nitrogen flushing where they're eliminating all of the oxygen within the package of the coffee. And that actually really does goes a long way to keep it fresh. But to answer your question, the low grade stuff, you can get coffee that's months old and people won't eat stale bread, but they'll drink stale coffee. Yeah. Cause they actually probably are so accustomed to the taste. They don't even realize it's stale. They just think exactly. that's how that's the flavor profile. Exactly. And especially because, when you encounter coffee out in the world at the bank and at work, they're usually buying the cheap stuff because they have to feed a lot of people. And so you actually, some people think that's just what coffee is. 
-hmm. And then you show them these specialty coffees and they're like, oh my God, there's a whole world out there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's spend a minute um, telling people what needs to happen uh, besides being organic uh, for the coffee they drink to be of medicinal value to them. Um, well, roasting, I would say, okay. is, is a massive part of that. And then brewing as well. Um, it, you can take an organic coffee and over roast it. And you're going to have, you're going to destroy the health compounds. You can also under roast it and it's higher in certain toxins like acrylamide. So again, that's why that roast is important. But any organic coffee, you're going to be getting health benefits from that. And it's a step in the right direction. Now, storage and transportation, again, I'm not a fan of those flappy bags with the little, you want a resealable bag if you can, keep that fresh because we've tested coffees and the quality, the health quality, levels of antioxidants, levels of beneficial compounds like malic acid, melanoidins, and all these you know, big words, they go down as the coffee gets stale, no surprise, right? Yeah. So keeping it fresh um, and then brewing it, you don't want to in, in, in any way over roast it, over steep it, ruin it in any way, right? but just any general normal brewing practice and you should be fine. Oh, and maybe most importantly, don't add those artificial sweeteners. Yeah. Don't add, uh, you know, any of that fake stuff, you know, right. dairy, there's a lot of back and forth, believe what you will about dairy, but the creamers stay right. away from those, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the distinction you made is creamer versus cream. So we're yes. not talking about just like cream, half and half is basically dairy. You're talking about the creamer with all the, you turn around, look at the label and all the stuff you can't pronounce and the sugars and the, just the That stuff's really bad for you. Oh, yeah. Horrifying. I love the creams and the milks, you know, and, and, uh, but again, I know it's a hot topic. Many people say that those sorts of things aren't healthy. So I'm not here to take a stance on that, but I will say definitively that just about every doctor I've talked to says avoid the artificial creamers. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So given the, the COVID climate that we are all in um, right now and a no end in sight, um, let's remind everyone of a few of the proven health benefits of a quality coffee made properly. I'd love to remind the listeners of just some quick facts. These are meta studies, by the way. A lot of people don't understand that coffee has been studied for a long time and studies upon studies have, have shown reductions, massive reductions in deadly diseases. So I'd like to just go over a couple of numbers quickly, some of the biggest ones, up to a 30% reduced risk of Parkinson's. Many of the Parkinson's and dementia um, symptoms go away with coffee because of the way that it breaks down plaques and tangles in the brain. It's uh, one of the few things that really destroys those harmful compounds in the brain that lead to dementia and Parkinson's. Uh, up to a 40% decrease in type two diabetes risk Diabetes is a massive problem in this country, and coffee is, we were talking pharmaceutical level prevention here, 50% decrease in breast cancer when paired with certain medications, 30% decrease risk of congestive heart failure, uh, risk decrease risk in stroke as well, uh, up to a 25% decrease risk in stroke. So it's very, very good for the heart and how the heart functions. 15% decrease risk of prostate cancer. 65% uh, reduced risk of Alzheimer's, back to the brain there. And then finally, it's great for your liver. 40% decreased risk of liver cancer and can even reverse liver damage caused by things like too much alcohol, too much sugar. Get off that stuff, get onto some good coffee. Again, according to uh, someone like Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, it's a great, great talk, uh, uh, kind of brew, medicinal elixir for your liver. That's awesome, awesome. And if I remember right, um, coffee is also super high in antioxidants. So that's a huge plus. I mean, that, that helps um, uh, with our immune system, right? Which right now, everyone needs to be pumping up their immune system as much as they can. And, All right. Uh, and yeah, it helps with so many things. The, the antioxidant level in coffee is far and away. It's, it's higher than any other part of the Western diet. Um, even, even much more than blueberries and chocolate. And antioxidants, they, they reduce the oxidization uh, in your body, which is, which is incredibly beneficial, but they also reduce inflammation. Coffee right. reduces free radicals, which reduces inflammation, which is causing, apparently, according to these doctors, it's the, it's the root cause or at least yeah. the precursor to yeah. most chronic, chronic disease. Yeah. yeah, almost all chronic disease, some yeah. of these doctors say. It's crazy. So totally. it's a big deal. Yeah, so... 
just, uh, you know, if you are a coffee drinker, you guys see, do your best to, to up level if you're not already drinking organic coffee, because there are some benefits then that you are probably missing out on. Okay. I have a true or false question for you, Jordan. Hit me. Okay. I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong because I've never seen this before, but you probably will know it. The Kopi Luwak is the world's most expensive coffee, up to apparently $600 per pound, and is actually the beans excreted by a Sumatran wildcat. So it's true. The coffee you described is secreted by a Sumatran wildcat and it is highly prized. However, I, I believe it was the most expensive coffee for a while, but mm. since then, there has been a more expensive coffee sold for $1,500 a pound that was pooped out by an elephant. No. So, so yes, but then also no. <laughs> true and false. It's true and false. Okay. It was But yes, the, the, it's highly sought after after it's pooped out by these animals, apparently. What? I don't think I could... Listen, I am, I am willing to try just about anything. You know, <laughs> I've been in this coffee world... People have brought up coffee enemas. They've brought up all these things. Yes. I'm down for almost anything. But when you talk about something that's been pooped out by an <laughs> elephant, I might have to draw the line there. It's just, or I'm not going to be able to. Or a cat. Especially a cat. Have you ever I cleaned a litter box? Yeah, especially <laughs> a cat. <laughs> Find some coffee beans in there. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm grossing out your audience. <laughs> it's true, though. Would you ever try that? Mm, I... I not sober. <laughs> there you go. That's the right answer. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm pretty that. adventurous, right? Pretty I adventurous. That. But, mm, yeah, that that might take some preparation. <laughs> oh my say? gosh, that's hilarious. Oh yeah, yeah, and the whole coffee enema thing too. Um, yep, I know it's true. There's tons of research on it. Yeah. I have the kit. But I've had it for like eight years, and it's like still in the closet. You're I just like me. <laughs> oh god that's hilarious just like me yeah yeah someday maybe i don't know we'll and we'll maybe someday we'll each do it we'll compare notes i don't know right <laughs> anyway okay here's my my final um question it's a multiple choice you will know nothing about this so you're gonna have to be psychic or just take your best shot so how many lumps of sugar did my grandmother let me have in my coffee when i was a wee child is it one or two or three or none of the above? I'm going to say three. Ooh, that's a pretty good guess. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give oh, it to you. What is it? Yeah, it's, it, usually it would be two, mm -hmm. but then she would sometimes let me do this little trick with a third, not a trick, but this little thing with the third lump where she said, you put it, you put the third lump on your spoon and then you dip your spoon into your coffee and get a little bit of coffee on the spoon with the sugar lump. And then you kind of slurp your coffee through oh. the sugar lump. Yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. was... Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure she probably learned that from the Norwegian and Swedish, um, you know, family heritage <laughs> ancestors. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so occasionally I would get to do that um, because, of course, you know, grandma had no idea that, you know, sugar is horrible. <laughs> of course. No, that's really sweet. Pardon the pun. That's really sweet yeah. because right. uh, I remember this the last time we spoke too. That's really cool that a lot of people have these really fond memories of yeah. you know loved ones that they'll they, they identify with that moment so deeply and and it's always around uh, frequently around coffee so totally yeah it's special coffee is uh it makes memories you know yes. it's just a smell i can't wait to get up in the morning and have coffee it's it's, it's true uh, it's a special thing well we Jordan, appreciate that yeah, you, you have been so awesome again to uh, come back on, spend a little time with us and share what I think is the most fascinating information. Please remind people where they can find out more about you and everything you have to share. Of course. Uh, the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. Go subscribe. Find it on any podcast app on Spotify, on iTunes, whatever. Just Google Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. YouTube, whatever. Um, also, check out some of my other projects. The Mastering Happiness podcast is great tools and principles for a happier, healthier life. Um, and follow me at Jordan River IG on Instagram.
awesome. Thank you everyone for hanging out with Jordan and I. And remember, good coffee is good for you. And it's good fun too. Coffee is a superfood. It's full of great medicinal properties. So if you get the right stuff, prepare it the right way, you are sure to benefit. Oh, and make sure to check out um, everything that Jordan told you. But also, we did a uh, we did an episode. It was episode sixty nine where we talked more about uh, coffee, uh, things that we didn't even talk about here. So if you're interested, go back and check that episode episode out as well. And of course, if you would like some guidance, uh, getting unstuck, up leveling any aspect of your mental diet, your physical health. Of course, head on over to lauriebischoff.com and you can find out what private coaching with me is all about. Please do us a favor, take a minute and leave some comments. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, subscribe, give us a five-star rating. It means a lot and leave a review because those reviews really inspire other people to give us a listen and hear all of the good shift being shared here. So until next week, stay feisty, my friends. Stay caffeinated, stay healthy, and go make some epic shift happen in your life. You too, Gary Vee.